so You're listening to a Mamma Mia podcast. Mamma Mia acknowledges the traditional owners of land and waters that this podcast is recorded on. It's a foggy fall Wednesday evening in November 1995 in the town of Sunnyside, a small agricultural city in the heart of the Yakima Valley in Washington State. Ophelia Gonzalez, her boyfriend Jose Aurelio and their baby are arriving home after an afternoon trip to Walmart. It's about 6.20pm and Ophelia hops out of the driver's seat, undoes their son from his car seat and heads towards the front door, leaving Jose to make his way out of the passenger's seat and collect their day's purchases from the back. All of a sudden, two shots pierce through the night. Bang, bang, then running. Jose has been shot twice in the head, the bullets piercing straight through the tinted window of the couple's truck. He dies instantly. Ophelia only catches a glimpse of his killer. She'll later describe a boy, around 15 years old, but she can't see him in any of the photos the police present her with. Six months pass by, and once again, she's presented with a series of photos. In them is 15-year-old Evaristo Salas Jr., a teenage gang member who's already had his fair share of run-ins with police. That's him, she tells the cops. That's the boy who killed Jose. What happens next is a trial, conviction and a sentence that will be pulled apart and questioned for nearly three decades. A young boy who will grow up behind bars, always maintaining his innocence. I'm Gemma Bath, and this is True Crime Conversations, a Mamma Mia podcast exploring the world's most notorious crimes by speaking to the people who know the most about them. Evaristo Salas Jr. was just 16 when he was sent to an adult men's prison convicted of the murder of Jose Aurelio in 1995. There was no physical evidence. Instead, the case hinged on the testimony of a paid police informant and the victim's girlfriend, Ophelia Gonzalez. But in the nearly three decades since Evaristo's conviction, the evidence given by those two key witnesses has been re-examined in great detail. Cracks, lies and omissions have been uncovered by journalists and documentary makers alike, all while Evaristo has spent his teenagehood and a large chunk of his adult life behind bars. Evaristo is 42 now, and in August 2023, he was released from prison a free man, finally exonerated of a murder he didn't commit. So how did this happen? How did a young boy from a troubled background find himself facing the most serious of charges in an adult prison? How did the justice system fail him so monumentally and why did it take so long to get him out? Jack Lawrence is the host of Australian true crime podcast One Minute Remaining, which interviews inmates serving lengthy prison sentences for a range of different crimes. He spoke to Evaristo at length while he was still in prison and has continued to stay in touch as he begins a new chapter in his life, one not defined by the inside of a prison cell. Jack joins me now. Jack, you interview inmates serving lengthy prison sentences. What drew you to telling the stories of the convicted over the victim? It all happened by accident, stumbling across the story of the first lady we talk about, Derese Moore. I found her story and it was all supposed to be part of a different podcast that I was making that never really happened. And her story is fascinating. And the more I sort of told people about her story, I could see people really interested because it is a different side of things. You hear a lot from victims in these cases, which you 100% should, of course, but you never really hear from the people convicted of these crimes. And there's always, as they say, two sides to every story, or some people say three sides to every story, their side, the other person's side, and then the truth. So I just found it fascinating that, you know, you watch these documentaries, you listen to other podcasts, you always hear from detectives, prosecutors, 
journalists, but you never really usually hear that often from the person actually convicted. So once I spoke to Doris, her story is fascinating. I then said, hey, do you have any more people that would talk to me? And she said, yes. And it kind of snowballed from there. That's how the show was born. And then, you know, I've just found stories from people contacting me just to say, have you seen this person's story, that person's story? Because I don't talk to just people who say they're innocent. I do talk to people who say they're guilty of the crimes that they've committed. But it has obviously skewed heavily towards a lot of people who say they're innocent of the crimes that they've committed, which is the case of the story we'll talk about today. So how did you come across Evaristo Salas' story and come to interview him? Doing this podcast, you know, you've always got to find content for the next show. And so I'm always reading news stories or watching TV shows. And I was watching a show on Stan, not sponsored, (laughs) and they had a show called The Wrong Man. The whole premise of this show was talking to men who had said they were innocent of the crimes they were convicted of, and they had a bit of a team put together of investigators who went out and actually investigated these people's claims of of innocence. And one of the stories was of Evaristo Salas Jr., a young bloke convicted of a murder who said he, he didn't do. They investigated it, and some incredible things were brought to light in this show. And as I'm watching it, I'm like, this is insane. Like, this guy's been convicted of this crime. He's been in prison, I think, at the time of the show, he'd been in prison for about 22 years. And I'm like, how's this guy still in prison? So I'm waiting to see them go, because of what we brought to light, he's since been released. And the show just kind of ended on this huge cliffhanger. And then there was nothing. And I'm like, so what's happened to him? So I started doing some Googling, expecting to find a news story about his release and his exoneration. And I found out that he was still in prison for this crime, even after these incredible revelations that had come out about obvious miscarriage of justice in in the case. It was insane. So I contacted him. And he was quite happy to chat to you? Yeah, absolutely. These people are always trying to get their story out there as much as possible, and they'll generally look for most avenues in which to do so. And I actually contacted his sister first. I found his sister first and said, hey, I've just seen your brother's story. I find it fascinating. I'm wondering if he'd be happy to talk to me. And she said, I'm sure he would be. And yeah, it kind of went from there. And I was half expecting to get a bit of reluctancy from him because he'd been on this show and nothing really had happened. So I thought, oh, maybe he's been sort of messed around by people in the past and he might be interested. Yeah, it was nothing like that at all. I came across an extremely lovely bloke who was just ended up being an absolute joy to talk to. So at the time you spoke to Evaristo and he goes by Junior, doesn't he? Yeah, so his father is an Evaristo Salas as well. So he's Evaristo Salas Junior and people generally just call him Junior. So Junior, at the time you meet him or start chatting to him, he's, you know, late 30s, early 40s. He's been in prison for a lot of his life. But I want to take us back to the start of this story. Can you give us a little bit of context as to where Junior grew up as a young child and what his family situation was like? Yeah, absolutely. So Junior grew up in an area called Sunnyside, which is a rural area within Washington State. People get confused when you talk about Washington in the United States to think of the the capital, but it's actually the state of Washington. He grew up in a very small town within that state of Washington called Sunnyside. Family situation wasn't amazing, which is a hell, you know, it's it's kind of a recurring theme with the people I speak with on my show. His father wasn't around. His mother, she was into drinking and illicit substances, and he was kind of left to his own devices. She had a lot of partners come in and out of his life. Eventually, in fact, One of his stepfathers, who he calls his father now, would be a huge part in his life and still is today. But yeah, so Junior, in his early years, was very much just doing his own thing. Sadly, that meant getting involved with gangs outside of the home. Now, I know when people think gangs, you know, in America, you think guns, violence, drugs. It wasn't really anything like that. It was more just kids being a bit reckless and destruction of property and those sorts of stuff. So he did come into the, the view of a certain detective who would again play a huge part in his life in a, in a bad way later on. But he said he was constantly getting picked up by police. It got to the point where they literally would come and just pick him up for anything. If something happened, they'd come and grab him and his friends and round them up and take them into police station, question them and, and then send them on their way. He'd never really been to prison as such. He did, a, I think, maybe 24 hours in a juvenile detention, throwing rocks and destruction of property. Again, his stepfather, who now calls his father, came and got him. So he eventually left his mother's home because it was just so, I mean, there was just, there's no structure whatsoever there. And he went to go and live with this gentleman, his stepfather, under his roof. But although he says that house was a lot more structured and and his father was far more loving, his father still worked incredibly long hours in, in which to provide for the household because he actually took on 
junior sister and he had kids of his own as well. And he was just a single man doing all this. So he spent a lot of time out of the house. So again, Junior then remained doing what he was doing on the streets and, and sort of getting himself into trouble. How old was Junior when he started running in with these gangs? Oh, like 10. Yeah, wow, it's so young. Yeah, it's actually quite incredible. There's a documentary that was made about gangs in the area that he was from and you watch that documentary and you actually, in one part of it, if you freeze it just quick enough, you can see a young, I think he was 12 at the time, 12-year-old Junior Salas with his head inside this police car talking to the copper who was driving around this uh, documentary filmmaking crew about the gang problem within Sunnyside, where he was from. So you said that at the start it was mainly, you know, throwing rocks and being a little bit of a child delinquent, but it did start to escalate as he got towards those more early teen years. What did that look like? What was life like as more of a, you know, 13, 14, 15-year-old? Extremely violent. Guns started to become a, a part of their existence. Junior says that he personally didn't carry a firearm, but they were shot at. He's been shot at multiple times, lots of fighting, because what happened was more serious gangs moved into the area and then they began recruiting these youngsters into their organisations and they started to take a more serious hold on the area, whereas before it was just young kids running around being delinquents. But then when these older guys moved in from different areas who were already part of more serious gangs, they then started recruiting the youngsters ar- around town and things got a little bit more more violent and aggressive and Junior would say that whenever he left his house, he would always have to plan his route in order to try and avoid rival gangs. A friend of his actually died in his arms when he was a youngster. They went to the store together to get something to eat. They came out. There was a bit of an altercation. One guy fired a weapon from a car. Actually, Junior ended up being in prison with this guy down the track, but he'd shot his friend and his friend ended up, ended up dying in his arms. And this was at like age 14, so horrendous. It's just a crazy life to imagine as a young yeah. child. I keep going to say young man. No, he was a child. No, yeah, he was a child, a baby. He was just a baby. He was, you know, he was 14, 14 years old when this was happening. Tell me about November 14, 1995. What happened to a man called Jose Aurelio? Who was he? So Jose Aurelio was supposedly involved in gangs himself. There was talk of him being involved in drugs. But on the evening of that particular date, he was in his pickup with his partner, Ophelia Gonzalez, and their child. They arrived at an address. He pulled up the vehicle into a park, stopped the car. His partner, Ophelia, got out of the car, got their child out of their car, and then she started walking off towards the entrance to their property. As she's walking down the street, she hears two gunshots. She turns around and says she sees someone flee the scene. She would later say was Evaristo Salas Jr., and sadly, Jose O'Reilly was killed. He was shot twice in the head and died instantly at the scene. Did she see who shot him? Well, see, this is one of the big conjectures from this actual case. So initially, for the first, I think it was six months from memory, she didn't pick anyone out of a lineup. She did say that she saw the person who shot her partner, but for the briefest of moments, three, maybe five seconds tops, that she saw this person. And it was at night as well, and she wasn't you know, very close to the vehicle. But after six months of being shown lineup after lineup, she would eventually suddenly pick Evaristo out of this lineup and say it was him. Now, there are claims that this was after she had undergone hypnosis in which to help her remember what this person looked at. Now, why that's important, because anyone who is placed under hypnosis, their testimony is then basically null and void. It cannot be used because especially if it's something they've come up with after hypnosis. So she couldn't identify anyone prior to the hypnosis. If she suddenly identifies someone after hypnosis, it's inadmissible in court because it's been proven that it's essentially completely unreliable. I think a lot of people think hypnosis helps people remember perfectly what happened. And it's been proven time and time again that it is just so unreliable. So that's why it has been completely admissible in in court. But this was never brought up in the actual trial that she went through this hypnosis. So her testimony was allowed. There were a few other people that heard the shots, saw something. They all kind of had different reports, didn't they? Yeah, it was very varying. Only a couple of people said they saw a youngster. A lot of people said they actually saw a much older person. And some even overheard an argument. And some said they heard a woman yelling, leave him alone, Ricardo. And this was supposed Ricardo was, was never found. But Some of the main witnesses basically said that they saw an older person around 20 years old, something like that. Definitely not 
a 15 year old, which was Evariso was at the time was 15 when this crime occurred. And he was a very small 15 year old too. So could never be mistaken. It wasn't like he was a six foot tall 15 year old. He was a very small kid. So there's no way he could be mistaken for an adult at all. But yeah, there was varying different reports from other eyewitnesses around the area because the housing was almost like in a shoehorn situation and there was other apartments around. There was a gentleman standing on his apartment. His testimony was discredited because he's had, I think, three or four beers and the prosecution said, oh, well, he can't, we can't trust his testimony. So, yeah, so there really wasn't many people brought onto the stand. Well, there's no one else apart from a failure that said that it was Junior, that's for sure. So when did the attention turn to Junior as the person that had done this murder? Yeah, so this is the interesting thing. So the detective in the case had known Junior for quite some time. In fact, from a very, very young age, he'd been involved in his life. He'd been picking him up when he was getting in trouble and he really kind of had a disliking of Junior. Now, he also was notorious for using snitches, people who would apparently tell him what was going on And this is where this particular person, Bill Braun, who became basically the key person to get Junior arrested, he would supposedly come forward and say that he'd overheard Junior bragging about this shooting and killing this person. So this is what made Detective Jim Rivard, who was the, the lead investigator in this, this is what made him apparently go out and arrest Junior for this crime, was this testimony from this informant. And did Junior have an alibi for that day? So Junior was at a a local store where they sold burritos and bits and pieces. And the lady from the store who worked there actually said to police that, well, he was with me at this particular time, I remember, because him and his friend were in the store. It was about 20 minutes after the crime had occurred. I think it was three kilometres away. And apparently he was in the store when she got a phone call from her mother to say, hey, someone just got shot near my house. And she remembers turning to Junior and saying, oh, some guy got shot. She said he was standing there. Now, this is, again, apparently around about, I think, 20 minutes after the shooting had occurred. So he had to get three to four kilometers away in 20 minutes, be in that store. And she said he didn't look flustered. He wasn't out of breath. In fact, he was sitting there eating a burrito. So he would have been there for a bit longer than that. But So that was his alibi. But that, again, this lady was discredited by prosecutors because she was a known drug user at the time. So they discredited her because of that, basically. So Junior is arrested, and this is like six months after the the shooting. He's arrested. Is he charged that day? Is he sent straight to prison? What does that 24 hours look like? Instantly charged with the murder due to this informant basically saying that Junior was the one that did it. And he's sent to jail, basically. He's sent to an adult jail, but at this stage they were keeping the kids in a separate section to the men in the prison or the in the jail who wasn't in prison yet. But yeah, he was essentially arrested there and then with this crime and he was going to go to trial. I want to talk about the photos because this is such a key part of this story. As you've mentioned, Junior was arrested by Rivard, this guy that knew him, this detective that had a lot to do with him growing up. And We've said that it was the informant that kind of made that happen, but it was also these photos. Can you tell me a bit more about that? Yeah, this is a really weird situation. So this is where things start to become questionable because apparently Jim Rivard was at his office one day sitting in his office with this informant who would come in to give him other information about something else. And Junior happened to be at the police station that day as well because he'd been brought in by someone else on some other charge or not. He was being questioned. And apparently Jim Rivard sitting there and all of a sudden this other officer comes to his room and says, hey, I've got that junior Salas here. Do you want to talk to him about anything before I let him go? And he goes, oh, you know what? Actually, uh, yeah, I do. So then he walks out and on his way out, he takes a Polaroid camera with him. Anyone under sort of our age probably doesn't know what one of those is. (laughs) But he takes his Polaroid camera out with him, goes out to see Junior and sort of grabs him. He goes, he suddenly realized, oh, actually, I don't have anything to ask him. But he says, I need to take your photo. So he then takes three Polaroid photos of Junior. What's interesting about the Polaroids he takes is he takes one from the front on and one from each side. So basically, like when you get arrested at the police station, they take photos of you and it's front profile and both side profiles. Yeah, mugshot. Yeah, mugshots. And then he sends him on his way. He then takes these Polaroids back to his office 
He says he throws the Polaroids just on his desk, just casually in front of the informant, not to show him them, just to throw them on the desk. And uh, apparently the informant then suddenly looks down and goes, you know, you were asking me about that shooting because apparently Jim had said, hey, can you see what you can find out about this? He goes, that's the kid right there. So it's just coincidence that his informant was in the room at the stage, saw the photos and said, yeah, yeah, that's the kid. That's the one who did it. And then it's the victim's girlfriend that kind of helps prop that evidence up? Yeah, so then they say that, oh, well, well, then our informant said this was who did it. So then we showed Ophelia Gonzalez another lineup with Junior in it and she picked him out straight away. For those that are a bit new to the justice system, this is what you would call, I guess, circumstantial evidence, isn't it? Yeah, there was absolutely no hard evidence. They would actually classify the snitch's testimony as probably more than circumstantial because Junior's basically said, I did it. But yes, it still is. There was no hard evidence. There was no gun ever retrieved. There was no DNA, no prints ever discovered at the scene. Nothing at all to tie Junior to this crime other than, first of all, this snitch. And then, of course, Ophelia Gonzalez, who said she could recognise him as a person who shot her partner. So a few months after being charged, a trial goes ahead, which is actually quite quick in terms of how a justice system moves. Sometimes it can take years. So he goes to trial. Apart from this informant, what else does the prosecution have? How does that trial go? Really, they've got the informant and Ophelia. That's really all they've got against him. But the trouble is Junior doesn't really have much in his favour either. Shop owner lady who said that she saw him, she was there. But the trouble is, you see, there was a lot of things that had happened behind the scenes that was not made aware to Junior's defence attorney. So your defence can only be as good as the information that you've got. And if the prosecution's not giving you all the information, which they have a legal requirement to do, they must provide the defence with everything that they've got or anything that's happened that could affect the trial or could help the defence. They have to have a legal obligation to present that and give it to the defence, which wasn't done at so many different situations. The hypnosis thing was never made available to the defence attorney. There was also another very interesting thing that happened regarding the actual crime scene itself, the truck. So the truck in which this victim was killed was impounded straight after, of course, the crime had happened because the police need to look it over for clues, for DNA, for any evidence that they can find to piece this crime together. So it's in this compound. Four days after it's been placed in the compound, Ophelia Gonzalez turns up at this compound. It's not a police impound. It's just a place that the police use to keep these sorts of vehicles that they need to look over. When she arrives, she tells the person there that, hey, this is my truck. The police have said I can come and pick it up. And the guy would state long after it had all gone through, he stated that he wasn't comfortable with the situation, but it wasn't illegal. So he gives her the car. So then she takes the car to another location, has it cleaned, repaired, because one of the windows was broken, and then has it sold. And then the car is gone. And this is before the police had had any opportunity to look it over for any extra evidence. Then the police knew this, of course, the prosecution knew this, but none of this information was handed over to Junior's defence team at all. How was Junior feeling through all this? Was he, you know, expecting to go to prison? Was he expecting to get off? Did he have a, a sense of what was happening in terms of what his outcome might be? The reason that the trial happened so quickly is because he wanted it to happen quickly because he was of the opinion that, well, once this goes to court, I didn't do this, so the truth will obviously come out. I hear that a hell of a lot. and I do deal with a lot of cases of wrongful convictions. And in so many cases, people always say, you know, I believed that the truth would come out. And that's what he believed. He believed the truth would come out. I mean, he was obviously terrified. He was a child. I mean, you can see photos of him in his prison yellows that they have him in the court and they're too big for him. I mean, it's just awful to see these photos. He just looks terrified as you would be. But, you know, he was still of the belief, of course, that the truth would come out. But then, of course, at one point, this so-called snitch gets up on the stand and he was a bit belligerent, actually, the snitch. We find out why he was, obviously, later on. But yeah, he was a bit belligerent and said, oh, yeah, no, he told me he did it. And that was sort of it. And then obviously, Ophelia comes out, she points out Junior in the courtroom and says it was him. And yeah, the poor guy really had no chance at all, really, no shot. We might as well keep talking about the snitch while we're here because while on the stand, he says he has a a medical condition and can you tell us about that? He changes his story a couple of times. So then Junior's defence counsel gets up and asks him, hold on a second, you said this one time before and now you're saying this. And he goes, oh, I suffer from CRS disease. And they're like, oh, okay, what's CRS disease? And he goes, I can't remember shit. 
<laughs> so everyone sort of looks a bit stunned. And even jurors who've been interviewed at the time kind of looked at him and was like, what? And we find out later that he obviously says that he didn't want to be there because we find out in a bombshell that his entire testimony is false. And how? <laughs> why? Like, yeah, yeah. why? Why would he do that? Well, he would do that because of our detective friend, Jim Rivard, who was basically paying this informant for information. Again, not disclosed to anybody that he was paying this informant for information. But he also threatened this guy with prison time because the snitch ends up coming out and saying that he was at the station one day with Jim Rivard and Junior was there again. And he, he points out Junior and he says, you see that? little S-H-I-T, I'm going to get him. Mm. He then supplies this guy with weed and says, right, I want you to go to where they hang out. This is where they hang out. Smoke some weed with them and get me some information on this killing. Because I still believe that Jim Rivard at the time had a belief that Junior was guilty. He didn't like Junior. He thought Junior was trouble. He was probably of the opinion that if he didn't do this, he's going to do something else. He was just out to get it. So he sent him and said, go get me some information. Snitch comes back and says, nothing. No bite, nothing. No one said anything about the shooting. No one knows anything about it, blah, blah, blah. So he goes, well, I've written this statement. You need to write it in your own words and sign it. And if you don't do that, you're going to prison for X, Y, Z. So this trial is going ahead in late 1996. When did that bombshell about the snitch come out? Not until the show I'm talking about, The Wrong Man, they're the ones that actually initially got that snitch to admit to this. So they contacted him on the show and he said, yeah, I want to talk. And he admitted on their show that it was all fabricated. So that's decades later, years, 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 years later. It's like 2018 or something, something like that. I can't remember exactly when the show came out, but it was like 2018, something like that, when this all came out. You're listening to True Crime Conversations with me, Gemma Bath. I'm speaking with podcaster Jack Lawrence about the wrongful conviction of Evaristo Salas Jr., Up next, we'll discuss how Evaristo cleared his name. So let's go back to the trial. What was the conclusion? What was the result? There was a jury. What did they decide? Yeah, so a jury came back and basically found guilty. The judge would then come back with his sentencing and and actually say to Junior, if I could give you life, I would. But he couldn't. So he gave him the maximum possible sentence he could, which was 30 years. And is the reason that he couldn't because he was a teenager? I believe so. Certain states in the US, even to this day, minors can be sentenced to life behind bars. But I don't believe in Washington state at the time he could give him life behind bars because of his age. But he could still give him 30 years, which is, it's not a life sentence, but it's certainly a a large chunk of it, that's for sure. And this is a big question because he spent a lot of time in prison, but what was his time in prison like? He basically grew up behind bars. Yeah, absolutely. So he was tried as an adult and sentenced as an adult to a men's prison. So at the age of 16, he was at the time of his conviction, he was sent to a men's prison, a prison called Walla Walla, which is a notoriously violent prison, rife with gangs. It sounds terrible to say this, but it's probably a saving grace because Uh, A Hispanic gang took him under their wing and protected him. I said to him, well, you know, did they want you to do certain things for that? Because obviously when you're in prison and you're in gangs, you're asked to do stuff, not nice stuff. But he said, no, they were just literally looking out for him. But of course, as he grew older, he became more entrenched in the gang and he was angry. He was convicted of a crime he didn't do. He was angry. He was scared. He had a lot of anger for many, many years. And that anger came out in violence inside jail. He got into a lot of fights spent a lot of time in solitary confinement, in the hole, as they call it. And yeah, his life became actually about the gangs. Outside of prison, he was sort of mucking around with gangs. He was sent to prison and became a fully-fledged gang member. Was there any kind of turning point in prison? Because the man you spoke to, you described him as a really nice guy. He kind of had his life a bit more together. Did something change? Yeah, absolutely. So he, as I said, he spent a lot of time in solitary confinement And for those who don't know what solitary confinement is, they call it the hole. They literally place people into a cell by themselves, shut the door. There's nothing in there apart from sometimes not even a mattress, just like a concrete bed type setup. And that's where they stay, usually for 24 hours a day for a number of days. And they're they're laid out once a week for a shower. Sometimes they get an hour for recreation. But again, that's just a cage on the outside. 
So he was spending a lot of time in there. There had been a, a riot again, and in a riot, all the gang members, they jump in. That's what they're supposed to do. So again, he jumps in. And he ends up being moved to another prison to be in solitary confinement again, but in another facility. So he goes off to this facility and he's got a long time to spend in, in this facility. So what a lot of these people do in these situations is they're allowed books. So he got a number of books on different religions, one of which that he really found solace in, which was Buddhism. And he started reading about Buddhism and how to control your thoughts and how to meditate and all that sort of stuff. So he starts doing all this sort of stuff and it completely turns his life around. In solitary confinement, he suddenly decides that he doesn't want to be this angry kid anymore. He doesn't want to fight anymore. He doesn't want to be angry anymore. He wants to turn his life around. He wants to focus on his future and and trying to get out of prison, trying to clear his name. So he completely turns his life around. He gets out of solitary confinement. And the next problem is getting out of the gangs because Hispanic gangs in particular are not overly fond of people just leaving the gangs. It's it's a bit of a no-no. So he gets out, there's another riot, and he doesn't jump in this time. But because he's associated with the gang, he's swept up with the rest of them in solitary confinement. Word gets around that he didn't jump in, and then they can't see each other in solitary, but they can still communicate. They talk to each other through the walls. And they started saying, you know, what's going on, blah, blah, blah. And he said, I want out. I'm done. And he started basically moving himself out of the gangs. And while he was in solitary, he said to the authorities, I don't want to be in the gang anymore. I want out. And give the authorities their due. They gave him a chance and said, okay, great. Well, we're going to send you to this other facility, which is a facility which is full of ex-gang members and people who basically just want a quieter life and want to do their time. And and that's where he went and began his fight again for freedom. Did that involve work, studying? Was he able to create a bit more of a, a life outside of just sitting in a box? The place that he ended up going to or spending the last probably seven years of his sentence was a work camp in Washington. And he actually became a firefighter. They have a firefighter. Oh, service. wow. Yeah. So he was fighting fires for quite a while, which was, he said, was just fantastic because they go out in trucks that are fire trucks and they get to go up in the mountains. And so he was doing that. He's big into to running. So he's doing his fitness and just educating himself on the outside world. He said he bought himself an iPhone for dummies book. <laughs> he went to prison at 16 in 1996. You know, no such thing as iPhones or social media or any of that sort of stuff. Yeah, so, a time warp. Yeah. And it, I mean, this is getting on for 27 years now. So he was getting on for the end of his sentence. Like he was only a few years away from the end of his sentence. But two and a half years, I think he had left on his sentence. So he was getting himself ready to be back on the outside. He'd been studying where he could and what he could. He said it's always tricky studying in prison because you start studying and then there might be a lockdown. Not because of your own doing. If you have someone fight in your unit, then they lock the entire unit down. You could be on lockdown for a week. So trying to study in that situation is just a bit chaotic. But yeah, so the place he ended up with the last seven years was nice and quiet and he just kept to himself, kept reading his books, doing some study and, and getting ready to get out. What about relationships during this time? Did he maintain one with the man he called dad? Did he have any romantic relationships? Is that a thing while you're in prison? He's an engaged man, absolutely. Yeah, he's got engaged to a lady who actually, much like me, saw his story on The Wrong Man Show and contacted him and they started chatting backward and forward just about life and she's actually from Europe. She's got a son who now calls Junior Dad because they've been together a long time now. But yeah, they started off as pen pals and the conversation was flowing and they just, you know, they ended up falling in love and getting engaged and she came over to see him and meet his family because, yeah, his his stepfather is still very much his dad and his sister as well, who's a huge supporter of him, who I first contacted, Debbie. She's been his rock and his support and trying to basically bring attention to this case and trying to get him exonerated and get him out of prison, which has been very, very hard because it's been ignored. Every opportunity and every appeal that's been put through has been basically ignored. Incredible that he was able to even form some kind of life with, you know, a relationship, work, study, all of that kind of stuff after everything he'd been through. And you do mention that he's tried to appeal over the years. I've read some of the letters, petitions saying, I've been in prison all these years, but How did the momentum for that grow? This man has been in prison since he was a teenager. Nothing has changed. He's not able to get out. How did the momentum grow? Was it that documentary or? He did another show as well. He did a couple of shows. And it's like anything with the media cycle, these types of shows, you know, this is why you sort of hear these stories and everyone goes, oh, how terrible. And then we get on with our lives and kind of forget about it and you move on. So these shows are great to bring attention, but they then move on and that's it. So it's more just his family and his supporters and the Washington Innocence Project got involved with his case. It's just a hell of a lot of legwork. 
it takes forever to get back through the system and the prosecution can really drag these things out for as long as they really want. So he took his case. Obviously, once they had all this information about the truck being cleaned and the, the snitch and all that sort of stuff, they took it back to Yakima County, who's the county where this all happened, and they got it back in front of a judge to be looked at. He essentially turned around and said, nah, there's nothing new here, <laughs> making the same arguments, and it was just ignored. So then it literally had to go up to the highest place it could, the Supreme Court, to say this needs to be looked at. Thankfully, a panel of three judges turned around and said, yes, we need to look at this. There's, there's some issues here. So he called me one day and said, we've had a result. There's an evidentiary hearing happening where it's going to be heard in Yakima County, but Usually what would happen is the judge in Yakima County, when it gets sent back to them, would make the ruling. But these three judges actually said, no, 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 we're going to make the ruling on this. Because they'd obviously mm. seen that there was issues here and it kept being ignored for some reason. So they said, you've got to do the trial. Send us all the information that comes back for that and we'll make the decision. So it was set for a week-long evidentiary hearing where they were literally subpoenaed all these people. Because in the past, they'd requested to subpoena People like Detective Rivard to come and answer some difficult questions and the judge basically said, no, not doing that. But thankfully, these judges said, no, these people need to be subpoenaed. They must be here to answer these questions. This evidentiary hearing went ahead. Junior did it via video link from his prison and his family were obviously there every single day. He said at the very beginning, it was looking a little bit like it wasn't going to go his way because Ophelia Gonzalez got up and she was asked lots of questions. And basically, her response to all questions was, I don't recall. Mm. I mean, this was 27 years ago. So that sort of argument was probably the best one for them to make in this situation. Even, you know, there was another officer, not just Jim Rivard, but there's other officer involved. Again, he went down the route of, I don't recall, I don't remember, not sure. So Junior says he was feeling a little bit disheartened for most of it because obviously it's very tricky to really sort of dig too deep into these questions if the response you're just getting is essentially no comment. Yeah. It doesn't get you very far. But the turning point really came on, I think it was Wednesday, where they got Jim Rivard up. So Jim Rivard comes up and basically Junior's defense team were ready and they just went in, basically, just were hammering him. You know, what about this? What about this? What about this? Did you pay your informant? No, I didn't pay him. Yeah, and then she would circle back and keep circling back to this whole, did you pay your informant? And he was just constantly going, no, didn't pay him, blah, blah, blah. And eventually she circled back to it again and said, did you pay your informant? Oh, look, I gave him like 20 bucks. Mm. And that right there was the turning point because of the simple fact. It has nothing to do with the monetary amount of, of what he was giving to him. It was the fact that he is literally now openly admitted to lying on the stand. He perjured himself. Wow. So the apparently prosecution jumped up and down. They're trying to stop questioning, all this sort of stuff. And eventually prosecution said, I right, we need a recess for lunch here. And the judge apparently was looking quite annoyed about this situation and said, yeah, fine, we'll recess for lunch. Comes back. The prosecution said, look, we, we rest normal questions for this person, but we would like to take a recess until tomorrow. Now, the judge apparently turns to the prosecutor and says, look, I've been given a date that this needs to be done by. And we are not going to drag this out any more than what needs to be dragged out. So we will recess to tomorrow, but this is what you're going to do. You're going to go back to your office, talk to your head prosecutor, tell him what's happened here today and what information has come to light here today. And then you come back to me tomorrow and you tell me what we're going to do. And Junior said he didn't want to get his hopes up, but he knew that was huge. Mm. And apparently that night his legal team got a phone call from the prosecution and said, hey, look, just want to give you a heads up. Can't tell you too much about what's going on, but just want to let you know that you don't probably need to work on your closing arguments. <gasps> And she's like, okay. <laughs> so so they, they didn't want to get Junior's hopes up, but they've said, look, you know, tomorrow could be interesting. And Junior was just thinking that it was going to go back. They were going to rule that he deserved a new trial. Because he said to me before this will happen, the, the best I can hope for is that they'll vacate the conviction, which means he won't be innocent, but they'll vacate the conviction and he'll get a new trial. And then hopefully prosecution will say, well, look, it's been 27 years. We're not going to do a new trial. Just leave it. They get into court that morning. And straight away, the prosecution stands up and said, we'd like to put forward a, a motion. Our motion is to have this sentence overturned and for Mr. Salas to be released immediately. And I almost started crying when I said that. <laughs> I'm always crying, like hearing it retold. I can't imagine what that would have felt like for him. Oh, honestly, I woke up Thursday morning to four missed phone calls from his sister. And I said to my wife, I said, I've got four missed calls from Junior's sister. And she said, well, you better call her back. 
Now, for a bit of background, I, my best mate's also called Junior, so she thinks <laughs> I'm talking about her. I go into my room, call her, and I start screaming, oh, my God, what's happened? Oh, my God, what's happened? She thinks my best mate's died. <laughs> oh, my <laughs> gosh. <laughs> but I spoke to Junior's sister, and I said, what's happened? She goes, he's been exonerated. We are on our way to pick him up right <gasps> now. Uh, he was released from prison that afternoon. After 27 years, the man is now 42 years of age. He was exonerated and released that very day, and he's been a free man ever since. And this was only a few weeks ago. So you've obviously spoken to him. What was that conversation like? Oh, amazing. Well, we had our first face-to-face Zoom call just the other day, so it was incredible. He was doing the Zoom call from his childhood bedroom where the last time he was there was when he was 15 years old and being arrested for murder. He was sitting in his bedroom talking me through everything that had happened and you know, he just said it, he couldn't believe it. He went back to the prison after being told he was going to be free and he was thinking it was going to take a couple of days for the paperwork to be processed and all the rest of it, but he was elated. You know, he's going back to, oh, you know, I've been, I'm getting out, I'm getting out. And then all of a sudden, if someone comes around, knocks on his doors, they pack it up, you're out of here. And he's just like freaking out and suddenly calls his dad and says, they're letting me out now, you've got to come and get me. <laughs> and they were two hours away, so they had to race to go and get him. And, you know, he said, just leaving the prison you know, he gets to the front desk and signs a bit of paper and he kind of stands there because he spent his whole life being told what to do and where to go and he's kind of standing there and, and they said, well, you can wait here if you want, but the door's there. Like, we have no control over you whatsoever. And he said that just being told that by someone from the prison that you can go, we have no control over you whatsoever. You go and do whatever you want to do. If you want to wait in here, you can. If you want to go outside, you can. For someone who's been in prison since essentially since he was 15 years old, now 42, to be told that we no longer have any say over what you do, you're free to go if you want. You hear a lot about people that are released from prison after spending so long inside that it is quite a hard adjustment. I mean, we spoke about the fact he doesn't know what an iPhone is, but he he hasn't even been around for the internet. All of these incredible technological advances that we've witnessed, he has not really had any part of that. Is he nervous about any thing coming back into the world or is he just excited? What's his future look like? I said to him, I said, look, what I'm worried about, you know, because he comes out, there's things going on nonstop. He's not stopped. It's all been going somewhere, doing something, seeing people, being at barbecues, people coming over. <laughs> and I said to him, you know, my biggest concern is at some point this is all going to stop and life will then continue. Everyone else's lives go on and your life is going to have to continue. And I said, you know, what we don't want is to you suddenly then come crashing down because obviously you're on a huge high at the moment. And thankfully, he's a smart man. And before he even left, he's had it all organised. You know, he's talking to counsellors about his time in prison and being out of prison now and adjusting his life, basically. He said even sleeping in his bed at his dad's house in his old room, he said, the bed's so huge. He goes, I kept waking up in the middle of the night because it was just, I'm like, I can't touch the sides. Like, this feels <laughs> weird. And he said the other thing that freaked him out was how dark it was and how silent it was. He wow. said, he's in prison. It's never dark and it's never quiet. He said, so, but here, he goes, it was so dark and there was just no sound. So just things like that he had to adjust to. He went swimming for the first time since he was 15. Can you imagine that? Him, oh, he hasn't my been, gosh. He hasn't swam in water for 27 years. And he said he was in the shallow end. And they're like, just go swim a bit. And he's like, no, 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 I'm staying here. Ugh. All these new experiences. Yeah, he's got a couple of jobs, potential jobs lined up. They're jobs where he'll be helping give back to the community, which is what he really wants to do. You know, he's trying to put together money at the moment to buy himself a car and getting his licence. I think he's doing it this week. And obviously his fiance lives on the other side of the world, really. Oh, not the other side of the world. She's in Europe and it's still a fair whack away. And so they're just trying to work out that situation as well at the moment. Obviously, this is all amazing that he's been released, but he had 27, 28 years stolen from him by the system. Is he angry? Does he plan on fighting for compensation? What's going to happen there? Yeah, see, this is the thing in America. Not every state in America, if you're wrongfully convicted, doesn't automatically mean you get a payout or you get any money whatsoever for that. The state he's in, you can get compensation. It's a lengthy legal battle. Mm. And I said to him, you know, what's the plans? He said, dude, I've spent 27 years fighting for my freedom and fighting in courts. I don't want to go in a courtroom for a quiet while. Mm. At this stage in his life, I don't believe he has any... He just doesn't have it in him to go and fight anymore. He just wants to get on with his life, which is completely understandable. What about people like Rivard, like Bill the Informant? Is there any consequences for them? No. No. Mm. 
there's so many cases that I deal with where there's just absolutely egregious misconduct by prosecutors. There's plenty of criminals out there, don't get me wrong. And, you know, a lot of people think that I'm this lefty who doesn't think prisons should exist, but I, I wholeheartedly do. You know, there's plenty of people in prison that should be there. And, you know, there's plenty of people that aren't in prison that should be there as well. But people, I think, don't think that the prosecutors in that lie, but they do. It's been proven time and time again, they, they do lie. And they do, you know, fabricate things and they do hide back evidence, like is in perfect case in Evaristo's story. But the issue is there's no recourse for that. If they lie or if they hide evidence, they can't be prosecuted themselves for that. That feels like a flaw. <laughs> well, 100%, because if there's, it's like anything. If there's no repercussions, yeah, it's like, if it's like saying well, I could go and rob a bank. You, you can rob that bank and take all this money. There's no repercussions whatsoever. Nothing will happen to you. Just take the money. Now, my morals hopefully would stop me from doing that, depending on what day of the week it was. <laughs> but if there's no repercussions, then people are just going to go, like this Jim Rivard, he didn't like Junior. He thought he was a bad kid. I guarantee you he was of the mentality, well, if he didn't do this, he would have done something else, so I've done the world a favour. But that's not how it works. I was going to ask you, how do we make sure this doesn't keep happening? But it sounds like from your answer just then that that's not really possible with the way the justice system there works right now. No, it's not possible. I talk to a lot of people in America. Obviously, I'm not in America. and I'm not a lawyer or anything like that. But from everything I've learned, there is so many issues that need to be addressed. You know, it's another one of these situations where, well, this is how we've always done it. I don't want to attack America, and I always say this to our American listeners, I'm not here to attack your country because Australia certainly doesn't, you know, isn't perfect. We've either. got our flaws, so we does our justice do, system. You know? <laughs> we just covered the story of Henry Kehoe, who convicted of a murder for over 20 years, and I'll go into that, it's a whole new story, but we're not perfect. But, you know, there are so many issues that they just go, well, this is how it's always been. That's like the jury system, you know, 12 complete strangers who have no idea of the law are put into a room and said, right, tell us if this person's innocent or guilty. Half of them sometimes are falling asleep. None of them want to be there. It's horrendously paid, if at all. But you're putting people's lives in the hands of 12 strangers. And, you know, the amount of times I've spoken to jurors who say, well, there was three of us that didn't think he was guilty. But it got to the point where we had to come up with a decision. So we just went guilty. <laughs> you just went guilty. And this mm. person, you know, has spent 30 years in prison. There's another guy I talked to, Temujin Kenzu. He's been in prison since 1986 for a murder that happened 450 miles away from where he was. Wow. He had 15 people say that he was over 400 miles away from where this crime happened. But he was convicted because the prosecution managed to convince the jurors that he hired a plane to fly there and commit <laughs> this crime and get back in time. It's absolutely Madness. insane. Madness. So obviously Junior is a victim in this story, but... I want to finish on the other victim because there is still a man that died, a man who was murdered. Do we know who killed Jose or is that still a question? No idea. Absolutely no idea. You know, Junior, first thing he said to me when I spoke to him after the exoneration was he said the hardest part for him was during that proceedings was seeing, because Jose Aurelio's mother's still around, he said she got up on the stand to talk and she was devastated. She was in tears. That was the hardest part for him. He said, because not only have they stolen 27 years from me, they've also stolen 27 years from her because they're now saying that, oh, sorry, yeah, no, we got the wrong guy. So where's the right guy or person who actually has committed this crime? And what have they been doing while they've been out of prison? They could be in prison right now for doing something else as heinous. There's been so many cases where you can look back on wrongful convictions where the actual correct person has been found and they've gone on to commit other heinous acts because they weren't caught in the first place and someone else was put up for this. The problem is in so many of these cases, don't get me wrong, there's so many great police officers and law enforcement and prosecutors and all that. There's so many people that do the right thing. But the trouble is when detectives don't do the right things and prosecutors don't do the wrong things, the consequences are horrendous. And the trouble is a lot of these police and prosecutors get laser focused on one person and then that stops an investigation or they get stuck and they, they don't have anything and they finally, you know, get a little thread of something and then that's it and it's game over. So it's terrifying in a lot of these cases. So, you know, some of these stories I hear about are just absolutely terrifying. Thanks to Jack for assisting us to tell this story. You can hear Jack's one-on-one -on -one conversations with Evaristo in his podcast, One Minute Remaining, which is linked in our show notes. 
True Crime Conversations is a Mamma Mia podcast hosted and produced by me, Gemma Bath, with audio design by Scott Stronick. Our executive producer is Gia Moylan. Thanks so much for listening. I'll be back next week with another True Crime Conversation.